Tonight, uh, we have a special guest on Time for an Awakening. Uh, that's former Congresswoman and human rights activist Cynthia McKinney. In 1992, she became the first African-American woman to represent Georgia in the House of Representatives. In 2002 and in 2006, she lost uh, to other Democrats in, in primary races. In 2008, Ms. McKinney was the Green Party presidential candidate with activist Rosa A. Clemente as her running mate. Ms. McKinney is a human rights activist now that she's out of Congress and always on the forefront of issues that affect uh, our people worldwide and our people in this country. Please welcome to the program Ms. Cynthia McKinney. Ms. McKinney, how are you this evening? I'm glad to be with you. I want to thank you for being with us. Ms. McKinney, before we get started, uh, with some of the things that, uh, that I want to bring up for discussion. I want to go back uh, to June 25th, you know, which was a couple of weeks ago. The Supreme Court struck down a key part of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, Section 4, if I'm not mistaken. Um, talk about the effects of that. See, because I believe that our people moving forward need to develop a new paradigm as far as their approach to this two-party system that we have in this country. Talk about the effect that's going to have as on our people moving forward, in your opinion. Well, um, it's a very difficult topic to, to discuss, primarily because um, I believe by our collective actions, black people are no longer interested in the exercise of political power. And so once we begin to start talking about the solutions to our problems that actually involve us flexing a political muscle and demonstrating that we are still alive, that we are aware that the black body politic, as it were, is still alive and that we are um, uh, sentient enough to understand what is happening to us. Um, I don't know what has happened um, but, you know, sort of the, the eyes glaze over and, you know, um, so I'm almost beginning to believe the propaganda that was that was put out by the special interest media during the <clears throat> first uh, time that uh, this um, electoral tool was used against me called crossover voting when basically the white press, the corporate supported special interest press, put forward the idea that the black community had arrived and that people who believed in fighting for civil rights were passe and that the black community had entered into a new era. Um, and so um, the Supreme Court decision is consistent. That was the line that was put forward in 2002 um, against me, and the Supreme Court decision is consistent with that kind of thinking. And that kind of thinking, unfortunately, exists inside our own community as well. But um, in specific, with specific reference to the Voting Rights Act and Section 4, which... Um, sets the criteria for whether or not a particular jurisdiction is covered by the, um, uh, uh, the, the requirements of the Voting Rights Act. Um, I predicted that in 2008. I predicted that because I've been through my whole slew of uh, redistricting issues with the Georgia legislature and including also with the United States Supreme Court. And because I come from a state that is covered under the, under the um, Voting Rights Act, yes. uh, that's the state of Georgia, I'm familiar with the way it operates. And so the political climate that was set by the election of President Obama 
there were times when you had racially polarized black voting. I say that we still have racially polarized black voting, but to a lesser extent, we still have uh, discrimination against black voters in a more invisible way. That doesn't mean that it's gone away. It just means that the the mechanisms that are used, like, for example, the type of voting machine that a particular jurisdiction gets, um, the number of voting machines that a particular uh, locality allocates to its various precincts. These are the kinds of things that we saw in both the 2000 and the 2000 for presidential elections, the um, treatment of voters themselves with the caging of voters, so you send them a letter saying that you have to have X and X and such, the proliferation of, of um, uh, uh, the requirement of special ID in order to be able to cast a vote, special ID special ID that discriminates, and the two-tiered voting system in and of itself, where um, if you go to the polls on election day, you're subjected to one set of rules, but if you just happen to mail in your ballot, you're subjected to an entirely different set of rules. And these are just a few of the mechanisms that have been used, but for... um, whatever reason, um, now there's going to have to be a whole new series of litigation proving that there's discriminatory intent um, with the enactment of these specific um, uh, voting requirements. And all of this is almost as if the slate has been wiped clean and now uh, jurisdictions will have to can opt out if they can show that um, they haven't discriminated in the last 30 years. But of course, we know that discrimination continues to exist. We know that the, if you look at the number of spoiled ballots, um, and if you look at that by race, where it is possible to look at it by race, you will see that the precincts where um, the uh, population, the voting population is major- is a majority black, you'll see that there are more spoiled ballots. Why is that? And so uh, black votes uh, don't get counted, don't get put in the queue so that they can be counted. These are things that all need to be looked at, that should have been looked at, but that won't probably be looked at or if they are looked at, it'll be another generation. And so basically, um, in 2008, what I looked at was just one criterion, which is the threshold at which black voters have an equal opportunity to elect their candidate of choice. And that's based on the presence of racially polarized black voting. And I don't want to get into it too much, but where there were jurisdictions that were white, majority white um, uh, uh, precincts that voted for Barack Obama, there's going to be a change in the threshold in terms of what is considered um, the equal opportunity of black voters to cast a vote. And what that does on downstream elections is critical because these new numbers will influence the way in which districts are drawn. I'll give you uh, an example. Well, you, you know what, Ms. McKinney, I, go ahead. My own, my own uh, congressional election. That's what I wanted to talk with you about on that. Because redistricting, along with uh, special interest pressure, was used to remove you from office. Can you tell our listening or give our listening audience a little background on what you're talking about in regards to that and in regards to the special interest pressure used on uh, elected officials and black elected officials in particular? Well, in my own particular case, um, 
my type of representation, which is straightforward, transparent, um, sort of bottom line, I'm not going to play any games with the people um, that I'm seeking their votes from and that that event that sent me to Congress, I didn't play any games with the blacks or the whites. If you came to me for help, you got the help, but you also got a little talking to in addition to that because the area that I that that initially sent me to Washington was was a very, very poor uh, in fact, the second poorest district in the entire state of Georgia. Um, there were practices there, political practices, that completely negated the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. I mean, these were jurisdictions that had the Klan still active, that had segregated proms. In fact, we still have these these uh, events. Um, uh, taking place inside Georgia with the segregated proms and 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 um, the uh, sending of black boys to special schools and pumping them full of drugs, um, you know, because they're quote unquote uneducable. Um, th- these were the kinds of things that I had to challenge when I was there, and I did courageously, uh, without apology, when I saw something wrong. Um, I challenged it, and most times uh, we won, <laughs> which is why I was uh, the pushback was so hard on me because we began to be able to do things in this district to bring black people and white people together. And you know that there's a special class of leadership, and I won't say leadership, I'll say people in positional authority and and those who control those in positional authority who would rather have us focus on each other, pit it against each other, so that no one will bother to take the time to look at what they, in fact, are doing to us and, and ways in which we can come together to organize ourselves so that we can throw off the repression and the outright oppression that exists from way on high. So those were the kinds of things that I was doing. I got a tremendous pushback. That pushback, one form of the pushback, came in uh, redistricting, where I was redistricted almost darn every two years. I was running in a new district. Um, This was something that was innovated by Tom DeLay, who did the redistricting, which normally is supposed to happen one time every 10 years, um, he redrew the congressional lines in such a way so that the Latino voters were disadvantaged and black voters were disadvantaged. And um, that was in an effort to keep the Texas congressional delegation uh, in a Republican majority despite the tremendous gains in population of the Latino community. And the same thing happened out in California, where the Latino community, where the black community was pitted against the Latino community for representation to the benefit of those who controlled the redistricting process. And those who controlled the redistricting process were a subset of... um, uh, how can I say a subset of a of of a larger community that was overrepresented in Congress and continues to be overrepresented to this day? So um, the special interest that you're talking about in 2000, I had been targeted by um, special interest. And well, you know, I won't even say I was given um, special attention. I wasn't given any special attention until something happened, and that was when I ran the very first time for Congress, which was back in in um, 1992, the so-called year of the woman. Um, I found it I found it extremely difficult to get support. I couldn't get support and. And, um, you know, out of Washington, D.C., and despite the fact that it was uh, the year of the woman, there were women's organizations, and uh, I couldn't even get the endorsement of women's organizations. And and there was something something very insidious going on, but 
what I discovered was that in one way or another, there was this thing called a pledge. And every candidate running for Congress had stated their position on Israel. And basically that had been done by the um, American Israel Public Affairs Committee that's charged with following very closely on these things. Um, they had sent a fax to me, and I was supposed to sign it, in the for and it was in the form of a pledge. Well, I didn't sign it because, I, you know, I have a little bit more sense than that. And um, if I, if I um, am going to sign a pledge to, for example, Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel, uh, continued uh, funding of Israel's needs at whatever, you know, at that time the current level was, um, the, the military superiority of Israel. If I'm going to, to sign... Uh, a pledge to those items, then I want to be absolutely certain that that's in the best interest of my constituents, of my com community, of my country, and of the global community. Ms. McKinney, um, but with uh, some of your, your colleagues in Congress at the time, and especially the Black Caucus members, what did they have to say about uh, signing pledges? Uh, when they represent um, uh, a lot of black constituents, signing pledges to uh, to uh, to support uh, uh, interests of a foreign government, did they have anything to say in reference to that? Well, there's a lot of private comments that are made, but I think the record would reflect that um, in terms of public comment. I've, I've, um, in, in my book, um, Ain't Nothing Like Freedom, I discuss my particular situation. I discuss the betrayal, in my opinion, of, um, more senior members of the Congressional Black Caucus when the issue was the, um, Durban World Conference Against Racism. <laughs> I'm glad and that you brought that up. How um, the, the issue of reparations was kind of traded for um, support for um, or lack of support for uh, U.S. participation at Durban. But that that trade was an unequal it was an unequal bartering that, in my opinion, amounted to a betrayal. And that's the way I took it. But what I learned in that process was that we have a number of organizations that are headed by black people, but that but because black people don't finance those organizations, when an issue of vital interest to the black community arises, those uh, organizations and the leadership, that black leadership of those organizations end up sleeping with the enemy. <laughs> oh. Ms. McKinney, we want to take, um, we do have a couple calls on the line and we're going to take them, but let me um, move forward because it's, it's several issues that I want to try to uh, talk with you tonight. In reference to the uh, the drone policy in Africa, in, in fact, the foreign policy period, and especially as it relates to Africa, the use of drones that uh, uh, then President Bush started, but President Obama has escalated. I, I want to get your opinion on some of those matters, but first, let's go to the phones and talk with Elaine in New Jersey. Elaine, are you there? Elaine? Elaine? Hello? El this is, who is it? Hannibal? Yeah. Hannibal in North Philadelphia. Hannibal, okay. you're on the air. Hey, hey, hey. Hello to y'all, and hello to Sister Cynthia McKinney. Um, Hi, Hannibal. How are you doing? You answered my first question. Um, Ain't Nothing But Freedom, that's the name of your book? Yes. Right. When was it published? Um, earlier this year. Okay, great. I'm going to look for it Just tomorrow. Just a few months ago, actually. <laughs> I, I'm going to definitely look for it tomorrow. Secondly, and more importantly, 
The black activist community has been very critical of President Obama. I want to know what your opinion is on him, and I'll hang up and listen, okay? Bye-bye. Okay. Well, um, I join in the critique of the policies of the Obama administration, and I feel that I have a responsibility to critique those policies as honestly and openly and transparently as I have done any other, the policies of any other administration. Um, my opinion is that I'm some, somewhat unique in that because, unfortunately, there's been too much silence, in my opinion, from the black community about its needs, its hopes, its aspirations, its investment in the political process, and what it expects in return as a dividend for on that investment. Every other community engages in the political process as an investment and expects dividends. It is only the black community that engages in the political process and expects nothing in return. Uh, <laughs> you, hit, you hit things right on the... Uh, Brother Reg, jump in here. Yes, Sister McKinney, I'm glad to have you on the show tonight. Wanted to ask you when you're when you're since you've been around and uh, in the, and looking at the political process, what's your thoughts about uh, the black community thinking about doing something else outside of voting? Since there seems to be apathy in follow up after they vote of the accountability yeah. process. Uh, you're right that there's apathy in the follow-up, but there's a reason for the apathy. Um, and I think we have to look, I, I, you know, I wonder where our academic community is now that I'm working on my Ph.D. And so I, you know, am looking at, um, I'm researching particular aspects of U.S. policy, one particular aspect of U.S. policy, and I see the dearth of research in certain areas, which leads me to ask a whole host of other kinds of questions, but um, the uh, black community, I don't think, has, has actually pr played in the game, in the political game, as of yet, um, voting, is, how can I put this? Voting alone does not make you a player. Okay. What makes one a player in the game of politics as played by the United States, and, and mind you, uh, this game is one of life and death, um, <laughs> but what makes one a player in this setting is not just the vote, it's the resources that are mobilized behind the vote, yes. it is also the agenda that motivates the vote, and it's Zbigniew Brzezinski talks about the grand chessboard and he looks at the world as a chessboard uh, with the countries occupying different spaces on the chessboard and what I would say is that our objective as a community ought to be to utilize the 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 um, uh, Shoot, I can't think of the name of the, the you know, the pawns, the knight, the queen, the, the play, the... The, um, the chess pieces? The, the pieces, <laughs> that's right, thank you, <laughs> on the chessboard to be able to utilize those toward our common objective, which, do, it's, which ought to be 
the enhancement of the quality of life in our community. But what we suffer from is the fact that we don't actively organize to put our pieces in play on the chessboard. For example, um, I offered the amendment to the farm bill that authorized the disparity study that found in favor of black farmers <laughs> that they had systematically been discriminated against by USDA. That was my legislation. <laughs> so you could say that I was a piece on the chessboard for black people. But putting that legislation in place was only part of the victory and the farmers, mind you, there's been a whole lot of propaganda, but the black farmers have not yet been made whole. The propaganda yes. is a lie. Yes. We can get into that later. Um, but what also was necessary in order to make the legislation come to life was we needed to have our assets with appropriate pl pressure in the White House and at USDA. It just so happened that at that particular moment of that particular farm bill, we had Mike Espy as the Secretary of Agriculture. So instead of putting a um, report together that was a whitewash, he appointed a black company that actually told the truth and put together the real report. So we had our asset at USDA. And it was only because we had our assets in the right place at the right time when pressure was applied that we got what we wanted and that was initially an admission from USDA that they had been discriminating discriminating against black farmers and an acknowledgement that the farmers needed to be made whole with dollar bills it's the only way they could be made whole for the discrimination um, so if we are not engaged in politics, say, you know, we like somebody because they dress well and they look good and they're tall, dark, <laughs> and handsome, and that's the only criterion. Or we like somebody because they dress well, they're sharp, we like the way they speak, they wear beautiful hats and beautiful dresses, and that's it, and they're always around us. They come and they take pictures at our meetings and stuff. And that's all they do? If that's why we engage in the press, we can get all of that till the cows come home. But that will not give us the well-being that the political process is supposed to give to our community. Another example is... In uh, about 2007 or so, um, the New York Times did a study, and they found that approximately 50% of black men between the ages of 18 and 64... Between the ages, let me repeat that, of 18 and 64, 50% of them were unemployed. 50% of our men unemployed. And yet, Democrats control the city of New York majority on the city council and I'm not so sure about city hall but Democrats for a long time have controlled city hall and 
Now we even have a Democrat who is the governor of the state of New York. So the Democratic Party has some power, and the Democratic Party has some elected officials. But nowhere in the agenda of the Democratic Party was there a line item that said, we're going to tackle the unemployment problem experienced by black men. Nowhere. And nowhere were we, our leadership, those in positional authority, pressing for an agenda to deal with that. Another example, which is even more to the point. Well, Mr. McKinney, do, do me one favor. Let me get, because Elaine had been waiting. Elaine in New Jersey. Okay. I'm sorry, Elaine. Sorry to keep you waiting, Elaine. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I just want to say, um, uh, Miss McKinney, I wish you the best in all your endeavors. And um, I'm I'm so happy that you didn't sign that pledge. And did you question the the, the members of the Black Caucus and ask them um, what was in it for them and why did they sign the pledge? Well, actually, thank you for your call, Elaine. Thank you so much for holding on, and uh, thank you for posing the question. Um, but actually, that's a story that's not for me to tell on other um, members of the Congressional Black Caucus. But you know, I tell my story in the book. Um, that's a story. That's a question that you should pose to your members of Congress. Well, you revealed enough, Ms. McKinney. You revealed enough. Let's go to Joe in Germantown. Joe? Joe? Hey, good evening, Brother Elliot. How are you? How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Hi, Brother Reggie. How you doing, Brother Joe? I'm doing fine. How you doing, Sister McKinney? How are you? I'm doing fine as well. Happy That's to good. be with you. Likewise. Sister McKinney, I just wanted to, 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 to tell you, to, to the listener audience what an honor it was. If you remember, Sister McKinney, back in April 2008, you came to Philadelphia and we, 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 you came on the behalf of a, uh, of a three-day workshop organized by Sister Cola Clark, with Brother Arnold Foster, and, and, and Brother pa- uh, Sister Paula Peoples, and Ar- Brother Arnold Foster, and, and, and Brother Khalil Ali. We met at the hotel out there right near the airport for, for a three-day conference. And, and, and what you shared with us that particular time, Sister, Sister McKinney, was, was enlightening. I mean, it was, it was very informative. You, you, you gave our community information that was very useful. And, I, and it's just a shame that, that because of tricks and machinations that she was, you know, you know, voted out of, out of Congress because it, it's been a great loss not only for the people of Georgia, but for black folks and people of goodwill, Sister McKinney, all over America when you, when you lost your congressional seat. That was a big loss. I mean, and, and, and our society, in my view, is still suffering from that loss now. We got a bad connection, Joe, but I, I want to thank you for your contribution. Thanks, thanks, Brother Elliot. Mr. McKinney, we're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, I want to talk about, uh, if we can, we, we still have some time to talk about the U.S. foreign policy as it regards to Africa. Also, you went to Libya, uh, and met with uh, Mr. Gaddafi and you took some other, uh, interested black folk over there for a fact finding mission, if I'm not mistaken. But I want you to go into that because shortly after that, uh, uh, the Gaddafi, uh, uh, administration or, or regime fell and he was murdered. Uh, I want you to go into a little bit of that when we come back from a break. We're joined in conversation tonight with a former congressperson and human rights activist, Ms. Cynthia McKinney. Let's go right back to the phones. Uh, P.D. Brown in West Oak Lane. Mr. Brown? Yeah, this is me. How are you? I'm, I'm blessed, man. You know me. I'm stay blessed. Hey, sister. You one of the real sisters in all of America. We need more like you. Turn your radio down, PD. Brown. We got a little interference. Yeah. I'm, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Did she hear what I said? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. You no, know, we met and we hugged each other. And, and uh, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm here running for a city council on the condition of the black man in America. And we're gonna yes, bring it absolutely. That's what we need. And that's what we're going to get. And I'm, I'm tough. You know, and they all, they, they, they run the scared. You know, I know they're going to cheat to win the election, but, you know, uh, because they had the power here in the city of Philadelphia. 
you know, but guess what? The message will be carried on. I'm starting a, a non-profit called Juji uh, Te- Tekamia, which uh, Juji means uh, self-determination, and the whole word means independent because I'm running independent because too many of our people are bought by white supremacy. You know, and, um, and and we must, you know, uh, come in the office, you know, so that we can fight that, that white supremacy. You understand what I'm saying? I know you were there, and I know that you had a lot of trouble in your years, your, your history there. But, sister, you are one of the strongest sisters, you know, in, in this country. And, and I read last night where the lineage of all the pharaohs had to come through, the strongest women. Because y'all, the, the, you, you, you nurture us. You, in other words, you are actually in a leadership position, even though he was sitting there as Pharaoh and they should kill him, my sister. And I'm telling you, you are one strong person. Now, we're bringing uh, city council to, to Berean Institute on the 29th of September. And I would love to have you. And if you wanted to bring one person, come up and sit with us that day. You know, because I have three job plans. May another don't have none, and um, uh, the city council don't have none. But I have three job plans, sister. You know that I'm going to be introducing that day. You know, so that we can put some of our men that's in shelters, coming out of prison, standing on corners, on drugs, you name it, can't find a job because I've had that trouble, and I'm a I'm a skilled mechanic in in, in this city and can't get no work. Well, I got something for him. You hear me? I want to thank you for your call, Uppity yes, Brown. Sir. Yes, sir. Let's go to Cy in Germantown. Cy? Yes, peace and hotel. How are you? Peace, Cy. All right, Brother Elliot, Brother Reggie. How you doing, my brother? And honorable Sister McKinney. Thank you. I'm glad I got in tonight. Uh, Sister McKinney, um, last year we on uh, Baltimore Avenue in Philadelphia, and it was an international forum, and Sister Pam Master, Sister Basim, and some other people were there help facilitating. And what you reported after your capture on that ship without help of the United States and uh, President Obama is not intervening, and that being taken hostage on international waters, where the immense amount of hundreds of thousands of Africans in prison in Israel, and it is the number one broker for organs in the in the yeah. entire world. And I know. If you can speak to your incarceration, how were you liberated, and the other people? And uh, I think you were flying under a Turkish flag, and about the conditions of our people in in those those prisons. And I just want to thank you for your tremendous awareness and courage as a real model of courage. And uh, I'll um, take my answers offline. And, uh, and thank you, uh, Reggie and Elliot, for the strongest show on WRJ. Thanks for the call, Cy. Si. We thank appreciate you. Thank you, Cy. Si. Okay. Uh, Ms. McKinney, uh, Cy si beat me to uh, one of my questions. I wanted to talk about the... Uh, the two times you went over to Israel on a humanitarian mission to deliver supplies to the people of Gaza, also to see some of the things that people complained about as far as being human rights violations, and you were detained on two occasions. I think one of them you were taken in international waters, and Sai si kind of beat me to that. But talk about those issues, Ms. McKinney. Um, the, uh, the Okay, yes, I can talk about those issues. I... Uh, wanted to give an example of the city of Chicago, which is in the news a lot lately. But a study was done by Loyola University in Hull House that found that without a public policy intervention, it would take 200 years uh, black quality of life to catch up with the white quality of life um, that is experienced residents of the city of Chicago. Can you say that again, Ms. McKinney? We engage in politics is so that we can have the public policy intervention to get rid of disparities like that. And we know for sure that the city of Chicago has 
and still is controlled by the Democrats. And yet there was no public policy intervention to correct that situation. And I would dare say that it's worse today than it was at the time of that particular study. Now, um, uh, both times that uh, my uh, the vessel that I was on was seized was in international waters, um, seized by the Israeli military. And um, when the, on that second time, when um, we actually were kidnapped and taken into Israel and went to Romley Prison, I was there in the women's section of the prison, but there were two things that I saw. One was the general population intake while I was being processed, and that was all people of color. All people of color. And inside my, uh, the, the wing where I was with the women were all, all uh, African women. And of course, from the prison cell itself, I began to report on what I was uh, experiencing and witnessing. And that caused a discussion inside Israel about, um, you know, were their policies racist? Well, of course they're racist. Um, but I got a chance to see it and tell on them okay. firsthand. Um, the other thing that has since come out more recently is the fact that the, the African women, mostly Ethiopian women, who are admitted into Israel through normal immigration processes are forced to take Depo Provera, yes. which is a, a um, drug that not only prevents pregnancy, so that's like a, a form of genocide, but also uh, debilitates the health of the women who receive it. So uh, these are all issues that, um, you know, sort of, well, if no one if you if if you're in politics in the United States and you sign the pledge, you're not going to ever ask a question about how people of color are treated inside inside Israel. You're not going to ask that question. And the only reason uh, I got a chance to talk about it and I get a chance to answer questions today like this on the radio is because I was there and I saw I saw what happened and I opened my mouth and told and it but it doesn't do any good if it's just me. All my singular voice does is make me a target, which I have become. I wear the bullseye on my forehead. I wear the bullseye over my heart. I wear the bullseye on my back. What is required is collective action. We didn't get into this situation by singular action, but by collective action or collective inaction. And the only way we can change our circumstances is by the opposite of what got us into it, and that is collective action. Now, here's the other thing. When we've acted collectively, we win. <laughs> we have won in the past when we acted collectively. We've won. So even if that win was a fleeting moment and then, you know, there was rollback and pushback and containment, all these different policies applied to our victory, but the victory was ours nonetheless. And I have a friend who um, is actively engaged in fighting an illegal foreclosure um, through their action, they model what a fight can look like to other people who might not have the courage to fight, but they can see this couple fighting and winning and what my friends 
at justice at home say is fighting is winning. We have lost our fight. And that doesn't mean we as a community, because I know that there are people every day in the city of Philadelphia who are fighting, they are community warriors, they are leading the charge. But they need to have a network of support. And through building a network of support, then you won't have to have mayors like the mayor that you have now. You won't have to have the district attorney that was prosecuting, um, well, uh, Mumia, not prosecuting, but I'm talking about the black DA who was as hard, harder on Mumia, Mumia's case for civil rights violations and everything and the unfair trial that he got. I did take the time to read the, the transcript mm -hmm. of, the, um, of the appeal, and I'm telling you what I read was, was shocking. Well, not so shocking because I know, but, uh, you know, that justice is a, a fleeting commodity in this country if you don't have tons of money to spend in your defense. But that this could be allowed to stand, and then you have these black people. I would encourage, let me just say this before our time winds up. And that is, I want the people in the audience to go back and look at the video clip from Roots. It's entitled something like... Breaking Kunta Kinte. That scene opens with Lauren Green uh, sitting in, who's the plantation master, sitting in his office, and then Fiddler comes in and says, um, uh, we don't want to be too hard on the runaway. Kunta Kinte has just run away and been caught. And um, so the time comes for him to get his lashing. And if you look at this scene, it's about nine minutes, and study the scene, study the role of everybody or bodies that are in this particular clip, and you will find that there is an equivalent role in the political life of our country today, whether it's on the national level or on the local level. There's the black man who actually does the whipping of Kunta Kinte. There's the white man who does the whipping. There's the black man who intervenes with the boss man and tries to save the life of Kunta Kinte. There's Kunta himself, who eventually is forced to admit that his name is Toby. And there's, a, there's dozens of bystanders, black, who are watching. This, this is a very powerful scene, and it's an analogy of exactly what is happening in our community today. Let's give those characters names in our community and call them what they are and then take care of business about that. Ms. McKinney, I want to thank you for your activism, uh, your work. You know, I feel privileged that we've uh, had a trilogy on this program. We had Ms. Cola Clark. We had uh, Reverend Pinckney out of Benton Harbor, and we've had you, Ms. McKinney. So uh, I want to thank you for being with us. I'm going to reach out to you in the future when these things happen on an international basis. That Your opinion on it, we need your opinion. The people need to hear your voice. And I want to thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me on. Have a good evening.